title of this talk is The Neural Roots of emotion aware, Emotional Awareness. And I will take as an experimental model, of course, for this talk, uh, a phenomenon which is affective blindsight, uh, which is the ability persisting in patients with cortical blindness to guess above chance the emotional content of visual stimuli they do not consciously perceive. And it's good to have a little bit of history because the phenomenon was initially discovered by Bert de Gelder in 1999 in a behavioral study on patient GY and in a collaborative study included Larry Weisskranz. And well, since then, as it happens for new phenomena, that received initial skepticism, and then it was confirmed by different labs, including I mean, uh, Alan Peña Group, and, and Alphonse Ham Group, and uh, Elisabeth Taladavas, and Silkander, so different labs using different techniques from fMRI to, to EEG to psychophysiological recordings and in, in different patients. So the phenomenon exists that, that seems to be behind, uh, beyond any reason to, to doubt about it. Uh, but the point was still, uh, several years ago, whether this, this can be confined to the visual domain. I mean, Larry's work has shown us that, I mean, Blindside patients can discriminate very sophisticated visual attributes. And so they can, for example, pick up the eye whites or the round shape of, of the smile and then attach a verbal label and say, that's fear, that's happiness. But it doesn't mean that the perception actually goes beyond the visual system, the non-conscious perception goes beyond the visual system and in fact creates a changes in other domains of the organism which are typical of when we are in an emotional state. So with Bea uh, and Larry, we pursued here uh, some experiments in Turin actually, there was the experiment I was mentioning, where we showed um, facial and bodily expression to blindside patients and we were able to make long story short to demonstrate that a non-conscious exposure to this stimuli actually was going beyond, beyond visual system and beyond and was inducing automatic, auto, automatic mimicry in the face so was the patient were showing emotional contagion. So they were actually in a, in a state of the organism that is typical of when we are in an emotional state. So not only the phenomenon exists, but also we can, I mean, speak of affective blind sight not just as a subtype of non-conscious processing of a specific visual attribute, but actually something that goes beyond the visual system. And I would like to focus here on, uh, um, on the neurofunctional and neuroanatomical correlates of affective blind sight. And my talk is organized around four short topics the neurofunctional pathway subserving uh, affective blind side, and I will present you some fMRI evidence, the neuroanatomical pathway, and I will show you some tractography evidence, and then I'll try to move from the correlational level typical fMRI study to a more causative level of explanation, if possible, integrating behavioral evidence, uh, imaging manipulation, and fMRI. And then in the end, I will try to present some results that probe the evolutionary hypothesis and the evolutionary hypothesis that, I mean, this kind of non-conscious processing are implemented in ancient part of the brain and so are devoted to process so-called so basic emotion of very primitive uh, stimuli. So let's start with a, with a first point. So we tested patient GY, who, as we know, has a lesion to the left V1 that results in, in right hemianopia. And we tested him with a kind of stimuli that Bea developed in, in Tilburg at the time still. So dynamic whole body emotional expressions. So there were a short movie clip of an instrumental action like opening a sliding door in this case that can be performed with a neutral overtone or can be performed with an, an emotional overtone like in this case. Then the, the two categories were uh, match for luminance and for implied motion, but in subjective um, evaluation and objective evaluation, so that we tend, we try to match the stimuli as close as possible, so that the only the, the emotional component remain to discriminate this two, between these two categories. So these are the behavioral results. Here you have 
anger in white, a neutral uh, expression in, in black, left visual field, which is the intact one of, of GY, and right visual field, which is the blind side, and 12 is a chance level. So as you can see, the patient had a nearly perfect discrimination in the intact left field, but they were also above chance uh, in discriminating um, uh, fear for, uh, anger expression from neutral expression when they were projected to the, to the blind field. So this task was performed within the fMRI, so we were able to have a look at the, at the neural correlates of this. So we first had a look at the neural correlates of conscious perception of anger. So we compared anger versus neutral when the stimuli were projected in intact field. And essentially what we had was activity in areas like STS related to biological movement perception. Uh, in areas like primary motor, as premotor and somatosensory areas uh, which are related to motor execution and preparation, which is uh, something that can be expected when you see an action performed with an emotional overtone, and in areas related to attentional modulation and awareness. So nothing surprising so far. We, this was just a control because the same stimuli were used by, by Bayer's group on, on intact subjects, and more or less this was the pattern of activity that, that was reported in, in healthy subjects. The most interesting comparison was, of course, uh, the neural correlates of non-conscious emotion perception of anger. Not only non-conscious perception of anger, but, but the neural correlates that were uniquely associated. So we performed this interaction. So we defined what was specific for anger versus neutral when the stimuli were projected in the blind field, the right visual field. And then we compare with what was specific of anger versus neutral when the stimuli were projected in the intact field. So what remains are the structures that seem to be uniquely associated with non-conscious perception of anger. And the results were activity in, a, in the superior colliculus and activity in pulvinar bilaterally. So this results, and others of course, uh, seems to highlight the, the existence of, the, of a functional pathway, subcortical pathway that involves structures that receive a visual input directly from, from the retina, like the superior colliculus or the pulmonary themselves, and that are known, at least in animals, to send projection to the amygdala that can process the, em well, the emotional content of the stimuli. This talk was prepared before Joel Ledoux talk, so I still use fear or anger just for the simplicity. <laughs> Uh, okay, we were quite happy about these results. We, we thought that it was decently new uh, when I ran, of course, in a, uh, in a quote from William James, which is from the past cent two centuries ago, and saying that the main function of subcortical visual structures is that of sentinels, which when beams of light move over, then cry, who goes there, and cause the phobia to the spot. So it was not a traumatic dramatically new uh, results. So anyway, we kept going and we tried to focus on the second point. So moving from the functional system to the neuroanatomical pathway. And that's what I'm going to discuss now. Uh, as we know, functional uh, fMRI data can outline the existence of activation between areas. These areas can work together, but not necessarily they are also anatomically connected together. And to have another all-time quote from Fresnel, anatomy is to physiology as geography is to history. It describes the theater of events. So let's have a look at geography now. And what we did was to compare the previous anatomical evidence in animals. As we know that in birds, there are direct connections between optic tatum, which is the equivalent of, of, of spirit colliculus, the nucleus rotundus, which is somehow the equivalent of the pulvinar, and the amygdala. And the same is true for, for rodents that have direct connection between these three structures. Uh, then Luis Pessoa, 10 years ago, and Ralph Hedlos rightly pointed out that this chain of anatomical connection was not complete, was not completely reported in, in primates. Because of course we know that the retina projects to the colliculus and also that the colliculus projects to the pulvinar. By the way, there's also the retina projecting directly to the pulvinar, anyway. And, but to the inferior lateral part of the pulvinar. 
And we know that the amygdala receives projection from the pulvinar, but from the medial dorsal part, which is non-visual, as non-visual responsive neurons. So in fact, what, what Pessoa was outlining here is that there was a link missing between inferior pulvinar and medial pulvinar in order to complete uh, and to provide conclusive evidence about the existence of this anatomical pathway. Well, this evidence, or sort of this evidence, has been provided by Dane Brown in 2010 in a tree shrew where they found this direct connection, but not those that Pessoa pointed out as non-existent. But they found a different fiber connection between the inferior visual part of the pulvinar and the amygdala. So essentially, the picture was that the amygdala, at least in, in these animals, was receiving two different, two different projections from the pulvinar. One, the previously well-known projection from the medial non-visual part of the pulvinar, and the second one, newly discovered, from the inferior visual part of the pulvinar. With this in mind, we set out uh, a tractography experiment in 10 healthy controls and patient GY with the idea to try to find evidence for the existence of this anatomical pathway in, in, uh, in humans and also try to, to define whether there were some plastic changes that occur once the patient has a lesion to V1 that somehow modify the, the structural connection between the structures if they exist. So we define anatomically in the, in the controls and in GY the three structures. You see here the colliculus, the pulvinar, and the amygdala. And we perform a, a tractography study in Maastricht together with Bea de Gelder and Larry Weisgans. So here I show you uh, the fibers connecting the pulvinar and the amygdala in one representative control. You see in yellow the colliculus, in blue the pulvinar, and in red the amygdala. So I would like to fo you to focus the attention on the fact that we were able to define two different fiber bundles connecting pulvinar and the amygdala. One connecting the amygdala with the superior medial portion of the pulvinar, and the other one connecting the amygdala with the inferior lateral portion of the pulvinar, which is the one that we know is, uh, uh, is visual. This is fractional anisotropy histogram that somehow, with some approximation, reports the strength of the fiber connections in the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere of the controls. You see there was no significant difference between left and right hemisphere, though, though a tendency for the right hemisphere to be, uh, to, for this fiber to be more represented in the right hemisphere. And this, what we found in patient GY in this right hemisphere, which is the intact one, uh, you see a very similar pattern of two fiber bundles, and in fact, quantitatively, there is no significant difference between GY and the average of fiber counts in the controls. And this is this left hemisphere, where you can see the same pattern of connection, but as a neck, by a neck dye, you can see there were more, many more fibers in the left damaged hemisphere than in the right, and in fact, this difference was statistically significant. So it seems that there is an increase, a selective increase in the, dam in the hemisphere where GY has a damage to V1 in, in boosting up and enhancing the connection between pulvinar and amygdala. But these were connection between two structures. Then we perform the second step and we try to define the fibers that were uninterruptedly connecting all the three structures we are interested in, so the colliculus, the pulvinar, and the amygdala. And so these are the results in one control. Again, I made the pulvinar transparent to let you see that the fibers run uninterruptedly through all these structures and pass through the inferior lateral part of the pulvinar. And a second finding which is important to notice is that the other fibers connecting the amygdala with a, with a dorsal medial part of the pulvinar are not represented. So this connection seems to be, including the colliculus, seems to define and refine our analysis and outline only 
the fiber passing through the through inferior part of the pulvina, which are supposed to be uh, visual. This is the comparison between left and right hemisphere. And this is the right hemisphere of patient GY, again, with a very similar pattern to those reported in controls, and no significant difference in the strength of the fibers. And when we were analyzing the left damaged hemisphere, we found more fibers in the damaged side than in intact side, and in fact, the difference was statistically significant. And here you can see the short movie clip showing from different perspectives the fibers in the brain of GY. So these results seems to show that there is a selective plastic mechanisms that once, once V1 is damaged, then increases the strength of the connection between colliculus pulvin and amygdala, and so far the pathway, at least within the limits of the tractography, so these are not axons, or it's the reconstruction of thousands of axons, but nevertheless, within these limits, we were able to somehow parallel the previous results in, in the tree shrew. And uh, uh, last year, uh, the same logic has been uh, applied by, by Bob Rafal, Andrew Bell in Oxford, uh, and where they started with a similar technique, uh, the monkey brain. Here you see an, uh, in yellow the colliculus, in blue the pulvinar, and in green the amygdala. And you can see that they were able to, to define a very similar pattern to the one that I just described, still connecting and the inferior, it seems to connect the inferior lateral part of the pulvinar with the amygdala. So this seems to be a coherent picture uh, across species and different labs. Now we move to the, to the third point and try to move our uh, understanding and our evidence from a correlational nature to a more causative one. So in order to do this, uh, we exploited the fact that there are distinct channels of sensitivity to different spatial frequencies. Uh, actually, I just would like to focus on the, on the magnocellular and the parvocellular pathway. Of course, they are both project to the, to the LGN and the thalamus, uh, but the pathway that projects to the, to the superior colliculus is essentially only the magnocellular and then the coniocellular, but that's a different story. So it's the, the, the parvocellular pathway does not project to the superior colliculus. And we know that the, these two channels have different sensitivity to many different properties, including color, including contrast. Uh, but one interesting is that the superior colliculus receiving mainly from the magnocellular pathway can process stimuli with low spatial resolution because the magnocellular pathway is sensitive to stimuli in low spatial frequency, uh, but not in high spatial frequency. So with this in mind, uh, along the lines that, that were entertained by previous researchers, for example, Patrick Villemier and Ray Dolan, uh, we filtered uh, fearful facial expression and neutral facial expression in high spatial frequency, so in order to be uh, channeled through the uh, parvocellular pathway primarily, and in low spatial frequency in order to be preferentially processed uh, by the magnocellular pathway. And we try to add the look of what this manipulation causes in the guessing behavior of the patients and in their neuronal correlates. So here we tested again patient GY, and in addition to, to him, we tested also no, it's, it's, it's just a mistake, it's not DB, sorry, it's patient TN, <laughs> uh, who has a bilateral lesion and which le led him to complete cortical blindness. And you see here the bilateral lesion to the left and right hemisphere and a 3D reconstruction of the lesion in the patient. So let's first have a look at the behavioral results. So here you have in blue fear and in red neutral uh, expressions. And then you have here unfiltered stimuli stimuli filtered for low spatial frequencies only and for high spatial frequencies only. And as you can see, fearful expressions could be discriminated above chance only in the broadband spatial frequency, so for the unfiltered stimuli and for low spatial frequency. But when the stimuli were filtered to high spatial frequencies, then the behavioral effect disappears. So the patient were no longer able to discriminate above chance level between fearful and neutral expression. So uh, presenting stimuli in high spatial frequency seems to suppress, to block the blind sight phenomenon. 
And then we had a look, of course, at which are the neuronal correlates of this by comparing what is specific for fear in low spatial frequency versus what is specific for neutral in low spatial frequency, trying to highlight what happens when the patients are able to display blind sight. And we found activation in the superior colleagues of GY and TN in the pulvinar again, bilaterally in GY, unilaterally in TN, God knows why, and, uh, and in the amygdala uh, of both patients. So also this kind of evidence seems to support not only the existence of a functional and anatomical pathway to the amygdala, but also the fact that this pathway seems to be causally relevant for the phenomenon to occur and to be reported. And this leads me to the final point of my talk, which is, goes under the title Problem, the Evolutionary Hypothesis. Uh, what, I, what do I mean by this? Uh, this again, before uh, listening to the to Jolidu talk. Uh, there is a common uh, distinction between uh, basic and social emotions. So basic emotions are supposed to be phylogenetically ancient, innate and automatic, uh, the, to have a typical expression, patterns across species, uh, to have dedicated neural system and to be present across different species. Uh, well, for example, if you have a look at this short clip, I don't think you have problems is in defining which emotion. I would say it's quite surprised. And if you look at this one also, I don't think you have problem in defining which is the emotion the animal feels. Another magic trick. is supposed to be different with facial expressions of so-called social emotion, which are supposed to be phylogenetically more recent, typical of humans, learned during socialization process, and culturally dependent. So uh, we try to use this comparison between basic and social emotion because, I mean, it's often claimed, well, that this subcortical pathway, the amygdala, responds automatically to, to basic emotion be because it is phylogenetically ancient and so it's tuned to basic drivers or, and to, or to primary reinforcers, as uh, Edmund Rawls will say. So like snakes or expression of basic emotions, but not to expression of social emotion. This is often claimed, but very rarely pursued uh, empirically, uh, with the exception of several works in the 80s by Ehrman and his group testing, testing responses to, to masked uh, snakes um, and but not very much uh, in, the, in the neuroscience domain, I will say. So we performed first a bowler vectorial image comparison in order to show that, to, to check for the fact that the comparison between two basic emotions, between anger and sadness, is not intrinsically more different in, in physical terms, in pixel terms, than the difference that exists between a pair of social expression like arrogance and guilt. Here you see I mean, in color map, the more you go to the red, the more those areas of the face distinguish between one type of expression and another, the more you are in blue and the more, I mean, the, the, the difference is not relevant. So you see there is for both comparison, the eye region and the mouth a little bit is the one that helps you to discriminate between two sets of basic emotion and two sets of, of social expressions. But the point is that this comparison is not intrinsically more uh, easily detectable than this comparison. And you can see also in this confusion matrix where you see that the difference between sadness and anger 
if and well, it's even slower, lower than the difference between guilt and arrogance. Okay, so this serves just to, to make sure that at the physical level there is no intrinsic difference between a comparison of two basic expressions and two social expressions. And then with this in mind, we tested again patient GY and we tested patient GB, DB. This time it's correct. What a surgical removal of his right V1 which led in initially to left hemianopia and then that contracted to left quadrantranopia. And this is a, a typical trial sequence. So fixation, then there was a sound announced in the presence of a stimulus in either fields. And then the stimulus was present for 250 milliseconds. And then another sound that announced the offset of the stimulus. And the subject was required to discriminate in a forced choice task between anger and sadness in one block of trials and between guilt or arrogance in another block of trials. And then to rate the confidence on four point scale from least to the most. These are the behavioral results in DB and GY in both patients for basic emotions during conscious perception uh, in the good field. So you see that to make a long story short, the patients are around 80% correct when the expressions are presented to their intact normal field. And this is very similar for basic expression and for social expression. So that means there is no intrinsic easiness in, in discriminating between, uh, between basic emotions and social emotions, social expressions. Uh, the interesting part is, of course, what happens when the stimuli were projected to the blind field. And so you see that both patients were able to discriminate appropriately around, again, 80% uh, when the stimuli were projected to the blind field. So, in short, they were showing the classical affective blind side phenomenon. But then the accuracy dropped significantly for social expression. So they were not able to discriminate above chance the social expression when they were projected to the blind field. And we look at the pupil dilation data for basic emotion and social emotion. Here you see the time from stimulus onset, and here you see the pupil dilation, and you have in blue, oh, I don't think I see, uh, it's, uh, no, in red is anger, and in blue is the other basic emotion, and here the purple is, I don't, I cannot read it, I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, guilt and arrogance. So arrogance is in green and guilt is in purple. So what we can see is that for conscious perception of this expression, there is a significant difference in the pupil dilation which index more arousal for, for the presentation or anger than of sadness. But there is no difference between the two social expressions which are projected in the intact field. And in the blind field, this difference for basic expression still remains and the absolute amount of pupil dilation is even magnified, whereas it remains essentially the same for social expression. So there is a sort of a, a neurophysiological, a psychophysiological marker of the difference between these two expressions, which was present in the intact field and remain also in the blind field, but only for basic expressions and not for social. Uh, then we look at the correlation, the interaction between pupil dilation and confidence in the blind field. And here you have correct responses in red and wrong responses in blue for sadness and anger. So now we focus only on basic expressions, which are the, the one that produce the effect. The other were not interested for our purposes. And we see that there is a mild, though significant, correlation between pupil dilation and the subjective confidence of the patients in their responses, but only for correct response. So here we have an initial hint of the fact that possibly these physiological responses are important for the behavioral response of the patients. I'm not saying that the response is guided by the physiological reaction, but certainly there is a correlation. So it seems to something there. And so we made another analysis and, and tried to relate the timing, so the reaction times, where the uh, with a peak of the pupil response in the blind field. 
And again, in red, you have the correct responses, and in blue, you have the correct response, the, the wrong responses for sadness and anger. And the story is pretty much the same. You see that there is a significant positive correlation only for correct responses. And most of that correct responses occurred after the peak of pupil dilation. So what you see here is the difference in time between the reaction time, the behavioral reaction time, and the peak of pupil dilation, okay? So the more the values become positive and high, the more the behavioral response occurred after the peak of the psychophysiological pupil response. So it seems that responding after the peak, after that physiological response was full developed, helped the patient to respond correctly. And then finally, we met a, a combination of the three factors together in a regression analysis where you can see here, I mean, the, the, uh, the time of difference, the pupil dilation, and the confidence. And you see them represented in a 3D space. And in fact, the correlation, the, the, the regression was significant and could explain 65% of the variability in the confidence of correct response in the blind field, uh, but not for raw responses. So that really seems to, to tell me uh, that, to tell us that uh, the patients are able to take profit of their physiological responses, and this physiological response seems, seems to guide their Gaysen behavior uh, in deciding between, between uh, two basic expressions. So I was quite happy about this explanation and quite happy about the fact that uh, this seems also to confirm the fact that uh, non-conscious processing of, of, of emotion can take place, but only for phylogenetically ancient or basic, basic emotions, but not for so-called social expression. So I was happy about this until I ran into these two movie clips. Uh... Michael, you eat your veggies? which seems to me a clear demonstration that this cat has guilt. And, and this one also, and another couple of cats. This one is trying to make peace. The other is ignoring. For a certain moment. So this seems to be another example of arrogance. So I'm no longer very, very secure that, that social emotion do not exist in, in, in non-human animals. So thank you very much.